We're so excited that you're here. Welcome to Friday Cafe and welcome to the best session we have all year. And that is the Parent Voice Roundtable. And so we're really excited. We're closing out our fifth year. Um, so this is a wonderful way to celebrate and close the season. I'm Judy Carson from the State Department of Education. If I haven't met you before, I want to welcome you um, or welcome you back. Today, as I said, is the Parent Voice Roundtable facilitated by our colleague and friend Joyce Bosco. And so we thought about this and we said, really, we've been doing this work a long time. We really need a definition. We know what we're doing. And then we thought again. We thought, have we really talked to families about what they mean by family engagement? Have we really reached out into the community? Do we all mean the same thing? And so what we did is we joined together and we did many, many focus groups in communities, large and small. So we were charged with co-creating a definition and then co-developing a framework. And that, we thought it would take a couple of months, as I said, took almost a year, because co-creating really adds another layer to the work. It's easy to sit in Hartford around a table with people who look like me and say, we think this is a good idea, let's write it down. It's a little different to get out into communities and have focus groups with families. And in fact, one of our focus groups was just with dads. And that was fascinating to hear father's perspectives. And I know we're going to hear some more of that today. So the definition, this is what people told us, full, equal, and equitable partnerships. We're going to talk more about that today. Among families, educators, and community partners, promoting children's learning and development, they like development, people wanted that, that's much broader, that goes into all areas of a child's life, birth through college and career. This is a really ambitious definition. And people meant specific things behind each of these words, full, equal, and equitable. Full meant collaborating closely and consistently. Sometimes in family engagement, we collaborate closely, especially when there's an issue or there's a task at hand. Consistently is a growth area. That means over the time of the school year, everything that's going on, parents would like to get consistent information. Sometimes for the educators, we talk about a scope and sequence of family engagement that parallels your scope and sequence of curriculum. So that's a growth area for us. Equal, that's the idea of we're partners, we're at the table with different roles, but equal status and equal voice. Parents told us they did not care for the word involvement. They did not care for the word engagement because both of those seemed like someone was doing something to someone else. There was a giver and a receiver. They liked the word partnership. So you see that front and center in our title because that implies we both have equal status, although we may do very different things in this relationship and that's entirely, entirely appropriate. Um, equitable meant that families are empowered and it also meant removing systemic and structural barriers. Looking at our systems so that we look at who's not here and we talk uh, with people about the barriers they're facing and then work together to remove those barriers and again co-create the solutions. So this is deep work, it's important work. And this is the agenda we've set out for ourselves. So beyond the definition, we have some guiding principles to help us get where we're trying to go. And we'll hear more about this um, through our panel. Just want to highlight, this is what we heard from people. Number one, trust and respect. Every single focus group, every single gathering, trust and respect, we're front and center. Because of course you have no relationship without trust and respect. Trust and respect is the fertile soil that everything else grows in. We heard about two-way conversations. Sometimes in education we have a lovely one-way conversation going. We've been trained to impart information, but the listening part is our growth area. Sometimes sitting down and asking a question and just listening is the most powerful way to have the conversation. Linking family engagement to student learning. And this is something that I'm working with my colleagues in the academic area to strengthen. 
a lot of our family engagement helps build relationships, but does it, do parents always leave knowing more about what their children are learning and how they can support learning at home? That's what we're striving for. And one of the things that came up was about the role of students. Students are the most consistent messengers between home and school. But are we really leveraging students as partners in this relationship? Because students color how we interact with each other as adults. I know if, my, if I'm walking into school because my son won an award, I'm walking in with my head held high, love these people, best school ever. If I'm walking in for another reason, maybe behavioral, I am a whole different parent, right? So that student really has a lot to do with how we relate as adults, and we need to bring them in and help them understand that we're here to support them as a team. And then cultural competence, again, came out loud and clear every conversation we had, and that's something we as an institution in education, we have to co-create that with our families and our communities. And then parent leadership. We have some wonderful parent leadership programs in the state. Parent Leadership Training Institute, Parents Seeking ed Educational Excellence, really great top-notch training programs. Parents also meant parent leadership with a small L. Being leaders in their own homes, being leaders among their friends, having information that they, sh they can share with their neighbors. And one example that came up was the idea of AP courses, advanced placement courses. This mom, her daughter really wasn't interested in taking AP, so like, you know, a lot of work. Well, the mother was like, okay. Somebody told her that if you score well on the AP test, you can actually get college credit. This mom had no idea. Well, her daughter was going to take that AP class. And then this mom made it her job to tell all of her friends. These people had no idea that this could help with the cost of college. And I know schools put out information all the time. But somehow, we need to do a better job of making sure parents are receiving the information because they do want to share it with other people in their network. So that's the power of the parent leadership. So this, these are our guiding principles. This is what we're working towards to implement our new definition. And when you download that document I talked about, there are some very, very concrete strategies you can use, whether you're early childhood, elementary, middle school, we, high school. We even have strategies for after school programs. So please do take a look. So now I'm going to turn this over to Joyce Bosco, who is moderating and facilitating our panel of parent, for Parent Voice. And she is going to introduce us to our panelists. Thank you. So we're going to begin. And what we did is we created questions that connect with the different principles of the framework that Judy was just telling you about. So what we want to see is how do these principles actually come to life in, in the situations that our parents have been a part of, how are, what things are being done really well to support that, and what things do we actually need some improvement in? Oh, closer to the mic, sorry folks. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about, that's what the questions are aimed at, is to get a little bit deeper with some of this stuff and really try to understand how can we make things better in these environments by listening to the voice of parents. We're going to begin with a question that each of the panelists, and we'll just, however people want to do it, what order they want to go in. But the first question is, um, initially, each of you are trying to find help for yourself and your family when you began your leadership journey. At some point, you decided you wanted to go beyond the needs of your family to help other parents and families. What has driven your passion to support other parents to engage, advocate, and lead? Where did you receive re support from this? So we're going to go down the line, and um, Jen, would you like to begin? Sure. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer Lucier, and I am the parent of two awesome children um, who really are the drivers that got me into this work. Um, I jumped in very early. Uh, my kids, uh, my son went through the birth to three process, and then. Um, went into preschool at age three, and um, it was kind of at a crossroads in my life where my best friend had just died of cancer, and my son had just been diagnosed with autism. So it was like, I could go this way, or I could go that way. And at that point, we had um, a new leader come into our district and ask parents, you know, what, what would you like for your kids? What, do you, what are your kids' strengths? And ask us all these different things about our kids. 
and what we needed as parents. And for me, my answer was I wanted training to be able to effectively advocate for my child. Um, birth to three is a process that, you know, the partnership is already embedded in the way you do things. And then you go to school and it becomes about your child, not about the family. So that was really challenging for me. Um, and our district was very responsive to that, and they, they had uh, the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center come in and do a series of trainings for the parents that were interested in doing it. Um, and that's kind of how I, I learned to empower myself, and um, being somebody that couldn't speak up for myself, I had to learn to speak for a nonverbal child um, and advocate for his needs. And um, I guess I did a pretty okay job because a lot of the team members from my planning and placement team would refer me to other parents that were struggling. Um, and I just started helping people in my district one by one. And um, then other districts would um, have their parents come to me too. So it was, it started off little and then eventually I got to work at the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center um, who did the initial training for me. Hi, my name is Shanaja Booker. I'm a senior at Career High School in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, so I made a final decision that I want to do two years of Gateway and then two years of seven for early child education. But I have an open mind of either running my own daycare or going to DCF field. And just like due to experience like growing up, and I always had like a heart to the youth. I want to reach out to like team mom to start like my own group. And one way, I actually, I thought about this. I had to, I had to do a capstone project for a senior year to graduate. So I actually did care um, packages for team mothers, six boys and six girls. It was actually a good experience, like with networking, what different people, uh, different people. Everybody encouraged me to go, like you know, better and beyond, just the same person I am. And like everybody invited me to different events to get the experience and speak, so I'm going to continue. Hi, my name is Susan Sarmiento and um, I'm from uh, the city of Hartford. Um, my, um, I started uh, volunteering in family centers, in different family centers. One of them is Family Life Education. And the reason why I ended um, attending the programs was because I was a um, I had a child, my first child at that time, six years ago, and um, I had postpartum depression. I, I and I didn't know um, to how to figure things out. I was scared, and I started attending their nurturing program that they had, and it was awesome. So right there, I met so many moms just like me that they were trying to figure it out, things out, and also um, I met. Um, um, Carmen Morales, who was the uh, program coordinator for the Family Center. And so I just started a, a really tight relationship with her. And it was the way that she saw a potential in me. Um, she invited me to different trainings. And eventually, she has started to, um, um, I don't know, supporting me to host and co-host events with her. And then also, um, that took me to meet uh, that awesome uh, Joyce Bosco and to, <laughs> And I consider both both those ladies my mentors because I learned so much from them and they took the time to, I guess, nurturing me and giving me the opportunity to um, to help other parents just like me. So that's my story. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Stefan Palmer. My journey started when I came to Hartford. I was homeless with my three daughters. Um, I went to a lot of agencies to get <laughs> Are you hearing him? I just want to make sure. No. It is on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, my name is Stefan Palmer. My journey started when I came to Hartford. I was homeless with my three daughters. I went to almost every agency in Hartford, including DSS, and there was no resources for fathers. We were turned away. We were told we could not get help. We were told grants were written for single mothers with children. So. I began to go to different programs for the fatherhood groups. And while I was in the fatherhood groups, I was able to help other fathers find resources, such as housing, food, clothing. Um, I also took the PEP through Catholic Charities. I took PLTI through the state of Connecticut. Um, 
graduated from Capital for Human Resource, Human Service Assistant. Um, worked with the Aspen Institute, but along the journey, I picked up information, knowledge, and was able to share it with other fathers to help them pick themselves up, help them build a relationship with their children, help them to kind of shake the stereotype of dads aren't there, um, dads aren't important. And that kind of led to me starting a mentoring program. In the mentoring program, we work with not only dads, but we work with children and the moms. So why is it important to me? Because I feel like dads are that forgotten piece of the family. They get that bad rep. If dad was there, this wouldn't happen. If dad was there, this would be different. But then when you have dads that are there, you don't even help them through the door. You still close the door on them. Mm -hmm. So I feel me advocating for dads and advocating for children is important because we need a voice. We need someone to say, you know what, we're here. Uh, good morning, my name is uh, Kyle Parrish. Uh, my journey started about 22. When I was 22, um, I found out I was actually gonna have my son, which gave me a new perspective on life as if, as though I didn't have my uh, dad growing up or no real significant male figure. I looked at it as an opportunity, as a second chance. Uh, with that second chance, I understood that there really wasn't a, a guide into raising a child and how to nurture a child, so I was blessed and fortunate enough to come across a couple of fatherhood programs, which really got my attention, got the pot stirring, because I learned that although I might have been the youngest voice in the room, I had some type of voice still, which was very um, um, empowering for me as a young adult and was supportive. Uh, another thing that led me to go there is because I was actually going through the co-parenting phase with my son's mom, uh, which I learned that unfortunately in Connecticut, the scales tip a lot towards the women However, I wasn't going to use that as an excuse, so I continued to push forward and prevail. Um, doing so, it has brought me into uh, continuously graduating from the fatherhood program with Catholic Charities. I was volunteered. I probably graduated from the class about 12 to 20 times. And eventually, I just stopped giving me certificates, and I just kind of started help co-facilitating this volunteering. Um, my engagement began to get a little bit more challenging as my son is getting older, and I'm starting to get into his personalities and trying to not put off some of the little boy within me things that I might have been hurt from or not even conscious of. But subconsciously, they tend to affect the children. So I continue to get help. Um, I got involved with sports. I've been uh, volunteering for about three years. I started two years with Capital Prep uh, mentoring. Um, now, last year, I was with uh, Hartford Hurricanes. I find it to be very uplifting because it's unfortunate as many young youth that we see there aren't a lot of dads yet in that same breath I like to say there is a lot of dads there's a lot of dads that don't realize that they have rights there's a lot of dads that stuck under that stigma that Papa was a Rolling Stone and I'm just here to stand up for not only my son but other kids and let them know that men can be men men are being men and men really are eager to be in their children's life so that's much broken Good morning. Um, my name is Janine McMahon, and I am a family specialist at the Asylum Hill Family Center, a branch of Catholic Charities. I started my journey as a client at the Asylum Hill Family Center, migrating from New York City and not knowing how to navigate the systems here in Connecticut. And my, um, I went from being a client to becoming a volunteer. I realized that there were programs that were missing for the older youth in the center. And so I started a dance program. And by doing so, the director at the time, um, Maureen Bish, realized that I had some leadership qualities that needed to be strengthened. And so she invited me to multiple leadership programs such as the People Empowering People um, course, um, offered by the University of Connecticut. And from that, I went to become a PEP facilitator. And what Kyle did not mention is that he just graduated from one of my classes. <laughs> um, uh, I, I started working on the Two Gen Initiative in the state. Um, and I, I think being involved in Two Gen is what really led me to this work. 
um, myself, Stefan, and some other parents sat at the table with state representatives and all these organization heads from nonprofit and philanthropy, and our voices were really heard in the room. Um, Stefan was really pivotal in changing some of the um, language in legislation around fatherhood, making sure that fatherhood was included in this initiative, and it was because our voices were heard and our input was valued, it led us to continue our work, and it led us to creating the Two Gen Parents Academy, which by the way is happening next Saturday. Um, and that led us to other things. I met Melvet Hill as a result of my work with Two Gen, and she invited me to join the, um, to participate in the PLTI um, course, and doing that course, I realized that there was so much that I was missing and so much that I needed to learn. And having learned that, I realized that it was important for me to share this information with my community. And so I've taken all the information that I've learned throughout back to my centers. And I've done community cafes to help spread some of the information that um, the community needs and help parents learn and understand that they are their children's first teachers and that a lot of the development, a lot of the learning has to start in the home. And it was because of the individuals that I mentioned, Joyce included, who nurtured me and guided me and introduced me to different leadership programs why I was able to step into a role of a family specialist at the center. So I went from client to staff, and now I'm able to give back. And my journey is a journey from me to we. So I told you this was a fabulous panel, and I'm, I, I'm sure you don't feel disappointed at this point. Um, so we're going to just begin with some questions to go a little bit deeper into, you know, you heard all of them speak a little bit about, like, the support they got along the way. And part of that is just recognizing and supporting leadership when you see it. So no matter what type of program you are doing or how you're working with parents, when you see those sparks, nurture and celebrate that. And, 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 and look at what the next step is for that parent so that they continue to stay engaged and then really work from the other we often talk about you know they talk about dual capacity for family engagement in schools but lately we've been having a lot of conversations me and some of my colleagues and with these parents as well around what's the dual capacity of organizations schools municipalities to really partner with parents what do they need to learn? Because so often, I know myself, Belvet, different people in this room that work with parent leaders were asked, uh, Veronica is probably one of those people as well, you know, can you bring parents to, into a discussion, right? But there's no onboarding for the parent. Often the organization does very little to change the dynamics of how they were setting up their meetings and what they were doing. And then when parents don't, uh, don't engage in a sustainable way, somehow the parent is blamed for that. And so, you know, this is, we're trying to think like, what's the onboarding organizations need? So as you think about this work, really look at small but significant changes that you might be able to make in the work that you do. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but you go into environments that echo some of the things that I'm speaking about. And, you know, when you're there, push the envelope, push it, because that's what, you know, I think about some of the opportunities that um, even the panelists spoke to today, and it wasn't always so smooth engaging in those, those opportunities. There had to be somebody at the helm sort of pushing that agenda, because I remember even with the two gen work, originally when the parents came, they were sitting outside the circle of everyone else. And with somebody's, you know, hand saying, oh no, that's, that's not the way that should be. They should all be sitting in a circle around talking about this. So sometimes you go into an environment and you see things that you know are, are counterproductive to family engagement, but we don't always speak, and I'm encouraging you to do that. But we're going to start, the first question we're going to start with is with Sharnasia. And um, 
we're going to talk a little bit. This is built on principle one, which is build collaborative, trusting relationships focused on learning. And I do think that we often underscore this building relationships. We get people in a room. We want them to do something. We have an agenda. But we don't spend the time to really build those social connections of the people in the room, which is probably as important as what you're trying to get done, is that they feel connected, they feel like they belong, and that they're part of something bigger than themselves. So, Sharnasia. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Please share examples that you have experienced at your school and community-based <coughs> programs that have fostered building collaborative, trusting relationships with you. I'm going to start with that, even though it's like a three-part question. Let's start with that one. <coughs> so going back into my junior year from after having a baby was such a challenge for me. I was the type of person like to keep everything inside of me and like not reach out to nobody just due to... because. I really don't trust anybody, so I just stay to myself. Um, like waking up every morning, going to school, like make sure my child was straight. It was just, I don't know. I was just getting used to like, you know, the adjustment on. And then like going into school, like staying on my grades, like everybody was just like doubting me. So like I just beat myself up, like didn't know where to start. So I had the bouts like, oh, I don't want to finish school. So my administrator, she was like really keeping an eye on like an, out, an eye on me, and she noticed like that I wasn't feeling myself. So me and her had talks like every day. So then she had um, told me that the Family Resource Center in my school had referred for me to meet with this program called SPPT with Ms. Bath and her interns. At first, I was hesitant about it because like I don't talk, like I really don't talk to people. Like I don't want nobody helping me. I'm, I'm straight. I got this. So after like months go by, like every week they will come. I was like starting to open up. I felt like somebody really cared for me and I really appreciate it. And it really helped me like with my maturity growing up because it came a long way. Cause I was all over the place, like wanted to fight somebody, anger, <laughs> issues, all that. So you see how important it is to fight for these programs when they're on the chopping block because they really do make a difference in people's lives. So, um, how were obstacles or barriers removed so that you could be successful in finishing school and be the parent you wanted to be at the same time? So with that too, it, I came a long way because at first, like, it's like every time when I decide to like go for better beyond myself, it's like always something happening. So I used to react to like every little thing, and then I'm like, how to talk to myself, like you know, write in my journals, like talk to my parents, like this is not the way that I want. Like you know, I just want the better. I just want to live in a perfect world, but everybody's not perfect. So due to that, just growing up and like um, the person that I am, I just like you know, just push everything to the side and like just <laughs> strive for it. I mean, everybody's gonna talk every day. It's always drama, but it all depends on the person who you are, if you react or not. And everybody's gonna hate on you, whatever you do. So just live life. So on this journey, were there times when you felt like your needs were not being heard? And how did you resolve that? Mostly all the time. Like, I know just like times like the de like depression sometimes or anxiety I would get, it would just be like, like everybody hates me, like why I'm on this earth. But I'm like, that's not the way. Like negative is just not the way at all. So like just like going to like different programs, like groups, people reaching out to me, I'm like, I might as well just like you know <coughs> use the resource because that's what my mom used to tell me all the time. And you talk to a social worker, all that, and I'm just like you know denying it. Like no, I'm not. I'm okay. But like seeing like the past experience, like what my mom been through and all that, and then me being a teen mom and like how it really is in reality in New Haven, I just you know change. They're not hearing you that well. Too bad. <laughs> okay, I'll repeat it. No, you're doing fine. But just put the mic Okay. So, just like due to like seeing past experiences, like what my mom been through, and like me being a teen mother, how like everything just like changed, like from not like having a childhood, like you know, party and all that. I just stay at home, being a mom first, and just finish this school, because that's really it for it to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Okay, we're going to turn this over to the papas in the room now. And, um, you know, because there's so many times that fathers feel left out of the equation. And um, it's really important that they feel connected and, and just as involved. I, I remember fathers telling me that we used to do a fatherhood program at the family center that I had. And they would say, it's like I'm not even in the room. Even when they went to doctor's appointments with their significant other or their wife or their companion, they never spoke to me. They never looked at me. They said, like, it was like I was not even in the room. And so we don't want to give those messages to fathers when they make the effort to be there and be involved and be that stabilizing force in their children's life. They need to be acknowledged in the room. So. So Stefan and Kyle are going to speak to this, and, and you guys can just pass the mic to each other and, and respond. Um, so the first question is, as a dad, are there times you feel disconnected to schools, institutions, and programs that you have tried to connect with on your child's behalf? Um, with my oldest son, I have five children. Um, with my oldest son, when he was first born, his mother got to go to the mother and me program where they taught her how to change the diaper take the temperature and so forth um, I was not able to go so um, when I was left with my son I really didn't know a lot of things to do as far as a father is concerned in taking care of a child and I asked the lady why can why can't I take your program I, I, it's my first child as well and she told me point blank, well the program is only for first-time moms um, kind of left me feeling kind of awkward, feeling kind of down. And Jason Gibson, who is the director at the Boys and Girls Club in Britain, pulled me aside and he goes, well, if you want, um, I have two children. I can show you a few things. And he said, you know, just shake it off. Everything that's for the feet, everything that's for a woman is not for a man, but I am willing to teach you. And I never forgot that moment because I wanted to learn how to take care of my, my son while his mom was learning how to take care of him. And I'll see that one next um, As far as me feeling a disconnection towards any type of institutional program, uh, I would say more or less so it just highlighted, although I was going to Catholic Charities and doing the fatherhood program, it felt as though that was all that they had to offer. There were several of the different groups, uh, whether it was parenting classes, uh, uh, entrepreneurship classes. It was it was several other different classes. However, they didn't feel presented towards dads. It was like more geared towards women. Even down to uh, Janine, um, letting you all know, I just graduated from the PEP class or becoming a parent ambassador. That is something that I had came to the center several times and checked it out. But when you look at the table, all you see is a bunch of women. Not that I'm intimidated by it, but it's almost like that's their circle. Let's stay away from that and even still wasn't too engaging as if you want to come in, maybe you should be a parent ambassador until about last year. And I, like I said, I continue to go back to the center per my son's request. He loved going there and it's like, this is what actually drew me to get more in, in tune because I just feel like we need more of a male presence. Um, it's not, like I said earlier, it's not that the male doesn't want to be there, it's just unwelcoming. Um, and as my mom told me years ago, a closed mouth don't get fed. So this mouth has just been open and, ready to get going because I'm, I'm like I said this is my second chance for my son so even if I don't rip a, reap a lot of the benefits um, and change within the community for a man I just hope when he becomes a young man that he has those opportunities for him and his uh, peers Thank you. I know Stephanie you were you also shared with me at one point that um, you you were the primary caregiver of your children, but were, were asked for a court order when you went to pick up your children from school. Correct. Um, I've had custody of four of my children, which was a long process and a long battle in Connecticut. But every time I go to the school to pick them up, I have to bring the court papers. I have to bring proof they live with me. But when mom picks them up, they don't go through that process. And I think that needs to change in a lot of schools because I signed my son up for school. I brought him the first day of school. When he gets sick, they call me to come get him. So why do I have to go through an interrogation process every time I come to pick him up? It makes no sense to me. So, so 
Um, oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just to give a kind of example as well, I mean, maybe a lot of times when you go into like school meetings or conferences, it's almost like a shock or they're so surprised to see you as dad. And if they, they should pro the shock look on their face is almost like they're glorifying you, like we're so happy, which a lot of times, whether they realize it or not, it causes tension amongst the parents co-parenting because here it is mom giving all that she got on a daily day basis and when she's seen in public, she's not really glorified as good to see you mom. But here it is, if you see a dad, it's almost like you put the spotlight on us and make us feel a little bit uncomfortable where some people are shy and bashful. They don't know how to respond because maybe they are not as active as they like to be in their child's life, which, you know what I mean, tends to gets them to have a little bit of a pushback. So one thing that I would like to encourage or just put out there is that we have to dismiss this notion that dads are rolling stones. I mean, we are in a new day and age there are a lot of dads that are very active. I just had a talk last week with a friend of mine where she just kind of poked fun at me and told me I'm like a soccer dad because here it is, I do grocery shopping, I do wash clothes, homework, and make sure my son is good. So let's just open our eyes to see that the dad can be a nurturer and is a nurturer to the child just as much as mom is. When you ran up against some of these barriers or responses that did not make you feel welcome, were there, were there actions that you took to try to rectify those situations and how were those actions received or responded to? The action, the action that I took was I started a fatherhood group. Um, I graduated from 24-7 Dads, the National Fatherhood Association. And I started my own group. Started working with dads in the community, started helping them to find resources. Um, I got all the dads to sign up to POTI so they can learn how to advocate for the children inside of the schools. Um, through the program, we work with dads to get custody of their children, show them how to lower their support if they were in, incarcerated. Because some fathers don't know once you get incarcerated, they're supposed to stop your child support and they come home with an arrearage of like sixty, seventy thousand dollars which they shouldn't have to pay because they're in jail and can't work. Um, we've also helped dads get diapers, cribs. Um, right now we have about 25 dads that we meet with weekly and we're always looking for new collaborations to help dads even further. Um, as far as the school is concerned, well, by the dads taking the PLTI class, they learn how to advocate when they go to the school. They learn how to talk to the principal. They learn how to talk to the teachers. They learn certain laws that are in place that can help them be more effective in the school and help them get further for their children. <laughs> you want to reiterate a question? I'm sorry. Sure, that's fine. That's fine. Um, what I was asking is, when you you were in these situations where you felt unwelcome or you felt like, you know. Um, you know, you didn't feel like you being there was validated by the people that were there or over validated in, in some cases as you talked about, Kyle. You know, were there actions that you took to try to rectify that situation in some way? And then how was those actions um, actually responded to by those environments? Uh, I guess what I did, I just allowed my actions to speak louder than any words I can do. And I would just continue to be present in um, my son's activities at schools, um, sign up for his classroom dojo, meet with the teacher alone, um, let her just kind of give her a reminder that although we co-parent, if we really want to do what's best for my son, that we need to have our form of communication as well as with mom. Um, and like I said, I just continue to just keep pushing forward and search for groups and different agencies that help promote my growth as a dad, you know what I mean? It's like we can sit back and complain as men and not do nothing, or we can step up to the plate and keep trying. The thing about it is when we step up to the plate, then we need to be just welcome with open arms. Thank you, both of you. We're gonna shift the conversation a little bit to Jennifer now, um, who's gonna talk about principal Number two, which is to listen to what families say about the children's interests and challenges. You know, I know, you know, I, my son, I, had an I have an adopted son, and he had a lot of issues in school, a lot. And he was super, super hyper, right? And 
So what's the first thing they want to do with kids who don't behave in the classroom? Can anybody guess? Medication. Medication, that's the first one. What's the second one? Remove them. So the kids who need this social interaction and need to be in groups are removed from the group. And the third one was take recess away. So what does that do to a hyper kid? <laughs> they need the recess. They, I said, you know, I would be at the PPT and I would say, well, I don't think that's what you should do because you're only going to be harming yourself if you do that. He needs to move. You need to find. So what they do is they often apply strategies that are so generalized to situations and not always in the best interest of the child. You know, I understand behaviors need to be controlled in some way in a classroom, but trying to figure that out from an individualized perspective is something I think that schools often challenge. You know, and I think in special ed sometimes, it just may, sometimes it means they just put kids in smaller groups. It doesn't really mean they change. They do all this testing to find out what kind of, um, learning style they have and how they're perceiving information and then they pretty much teach it the same way that's traditionally been taught at least that's been my experience that's 20 years ago i hope things have changed but we're going to open this up to jennifer and she's going to talk a little bit you know in her role as a parent um, advocate and so in your experience with advocacy with parents and in your own jen i mean you don't have to just say with other parents that have special needs children, have you found schools to be open to their input about the services their children need? Um, in my experience for um, both my own children and in uh, um, districts you know, all over the state, I think that it really varies and um, the biggest influence is the leadership. So whether it's the building principal or the special education director, it's really their mindset and what they value. Do they really value parents as partners in the PPT process? That's already an adversarial process to begin with. Um, and do they model partnering with families? So um, it, I've had four directors and four different experiences um, with the different levels of partnership. Um, I've also noticed, because I have one student that's a general ed student on a 504 and another one on an IEP, and they're very close in age, so they've been in the same school, with the same school teams, and there's been a stark contrast as to um, how the team listens to me for my daughter versus my son. Um, and that was just very eye-opening and disappointing um, to know that I would be treated differently by the same people because um, one's in general education and one's in special education. Um, in general, I think everybody listens. It's more, um, do they act on what the parent is sharing? Are they really valuing and respecting their expertise in their child um, and really respecting what they bring to the table? If they are gonna be the only person that's gonna be the same member of the PPT team for their lifespan. Um, everybody else is gonna change at some point or another and I think that sometimes that's an opportunity we miss, we miss out on is taking the expertise um, that parents bring to the table. Oh, we need this back. Oh, she got one. Oh, she got one. <coughs> well, the other question was, can you provide some examples of missed opportunities to work with parents as full and equal and equitable partners in this work? Um, yes. <laughs> All right, so um, some missed opportunities um, at my own PBTs, and again, other uh, parents that I've gone to PBTs with, one of the things that um, happens more frequently than you would think is the parent does not get to talk until the end. And you've only had an hour, everybody else has given their report, um, they talked about the goals, and sorry, you've got two minutes left. And um, I, I was with a parent, she said, no, this is gonna take longer. And the director said, we're gonna have to reschedule another PPT. So every single person at the table got a chance to talk except for the parent. Um, and then later, that parent was blamed by the team for taking up their time again. We're, you know, we are, you're taking away time from the students because we have to reconvene this PPT. You know, you have to stop asking for so many meetings. Um, 
and this isn't just with one person, I've seen it with a lot of different people. Um, another missed opportunity, um, maybe that parent that overshares resources. Um, so a parent I, that I work with, she has a daughter that uses an augmentative alternative communication system, so an AAC device to communicate. And um, that's something that schools are still kind of learning about and learning how to help facilitate communication. Um, so when her daughter um, got this device, she tried learning everything she could about how to um, facilitate communication, how to grow her vocabulary, um, what the difference between core words versus fringe words were, and she really tried to share every piece of information she learned with her team. Um, sending them free webinars that she had attended or if she knew a conference was coming, she would send that email. Um, but it was really dismissed as, oh, she's being overbe overbearing, she's trying to control us, she's trying to tell us what to do, we're not doing our job. Um, so unfortunately, her daughter, her, she has surpassed her in her skills that the team has. So um, she has not grown in her communication for several years because the team hasn't moved up and um, the parent tried really, really hard um, to share you know, what she had learned with the team. Um, but I also wanted to talk about some you know, success stories for collaboration. Yep. Um, again, another parent um, advocated for music therapy, um, which you know, it's not a typical therapy. Um, you know, it's not like OT and speech where a lot of kids have it. Um, and she kind of broke the ground for um, the other people in our district. And we all tried to bring what we knew about our children. You know, they're completely nonverbal, but it seems like everything to do with music, they, they pay attention to. Um, and our district listened to that and they were willing to do a trial of music therapy. And they, they did a trial for several weeks with several different parents. And um, for my own child, he had already had his AAC device, he had had speech therapy. Um, music therapy started and he finally started talking. Um, it wasn't that those other pieces weren't effective, it was just that this was the missing piece because that's how his brain worked. Um, it turned out that he has perfect pitch, um, which is why when he has um, his echolalic, he actually will sound like the person he's saying <laughs> um, what they said. And um, through, the, through the music therapy, it helps him through transitions, it helps him learn to wait. Um, they're even using it now for building com reading comprehension. So um, it's been something that's been really successful in his life, um, and it just took our team listening to what we knew about our children and be willing to take that risk um, to see if maybe it would pay off. Um, and another one, when my daughter with her food allergy, so I'll go to a gen ed um, kind of experience where she was the first kid in her elementary school to have food allergies, uh, anaphylactic food allergies in 10 years. So they did not have um, any plans or protocols in place because it had been so long. Um, so. I talked with the school nurse and the principal and um, we talked about what I knew about um, how my daughter's reactions could happen and the dangers of her you know, touching something and putting it in her mouth because um, she was definitely allergic to peanuts and um, they took all the resources that I shared with them, they talked with my doctors, they helped, um, they, we all together came up with a plan not just for my daughter but for school wide and we had all of the staff, every staff member whether they are a paraprofessional or um, a maintenance person, they were trained to use an EpiPen and how to recognize the signs of anaphylaxis. So um, that was that was a scary thing to advocate for as a parent because I was so scared that you know she'd go to school and not come back. Um, but they really, really worked with me, and that work continued as she went grade to grade. And um, you know they wanted to keep her in a little bubble. Um, and like in the allergy free room, the allergy free table, and um, when I said, no, we need to teach her to self advocate for herself, and you know, the world's not a peanut free world. You know, she needs to learn how to pick people to sit with. She needs to know what to do if you know there's an exposure, something happens. And um, her school nurse for fourth and fifth grade year worked really hard with her um, to be able to build those skills, and um, we had really great success with that. Thank you so much, Jen. I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Um, and you can see how when you work effectively with parents, you can really make incredible things happen for them and their children. 
And I like the part that Jen was talking about, you know, teaching children to self-advocate as well. And um, often the power dynamics that exist um, within di different institutions and schools are a barrier to that self-advocacy. So think about that as well. We're going to shift a little bit and we, these questions are going to be posed to Janine and Susan. I think I'll start with you, Susan, if that's okay. Um, so, and this is around principle seven, which is supporting parents to become effective leaders and advocates for the children. And I would add, and for themselves, so, and for their families and for their communities. So, um, please share examples that you have experienced of how staff, schools, or other institutions have supported you to become effective, an effective leader and advocate. Um, as I was sharing, uh, uh, my, I have uh, volunteered a lot in family centers, and <clears throat> my experience actually in the family centers was, um, oh, thank you. was, um, me being a partner with them and me feeling that way, that every time that we met, um, especially with the program coordinators, so they had, they needed any input in the programs, they will call me and we will sit down and I will see the interest that they will put into really trying to find out, um, you know, um, well, because we will get together with other parents, so they will, you know, they will like to, they really wanted my input on that part to kind of like be that voice and take count of that. So, and it reflected really at the end uh, on the programs that they were running. So that was really important because I never felt like, and especially in that place, that they never looked down to me like, um, then there were other times also that I had experienced that um, um, different agencies will call parents for different events, and I think Joey's mentioned, you know, like um, they needed parents' um, presence. But when parents get there, sometimes they don't really know what's going on. Uh, parents don't really, they, they just don't feel comfortable because there wasn't that connection that you know, we need to sit down and really find out what we're going to do. Why it's so important your presence in this room? You know, that knowledge as a parents that we have, that we know what really is going on in our community, is so important. But it's it, it's not sometimes explained it really well to parents. So sometimes a lot of them, especially um, I'm, I'm a Latina woman, and the communities, um, the family center where I volunteer. Um, a lot of the parents sometimes they don't feel comfortable because it's a language barrier, right? So I'm really uh, blessed because I moved to this country when I was 19 and I was already, I spoke the language, so it was really easy for me. But I could relate to, to other parents and the difficulties that they had. So that was a, a really important key and I wanna really emphasize to that, the importance of taking in consideration um, to take the time to spend with the parents and really explain to them why their presence is so important. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? So Janine, same question. Um, please share examples that you have experienced of how staff, schools, or other institutions have supported you to become an effective leader and advocate. So as I mentioned when I introduced myself, um, the director at the Asylum Hill Family Center encouraged me to take leadership um, training, to take the um, PEP course, to transition into um, a, P a PEP alumna, into becoming a facilitator and facilitating my own classes. Um, Melvet encouraged me to do the Parent Leadership Training Institute, and after graduating from that, encouraged me to go on to becoming a PLTI facilitator so I've always had individuals who saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself, who encouraged me, but not only encouraged me to take those courses, but who supported me and um, were my cheerleaders as I did um, the coursework. And as I did those, that coursework and I completed um, and graduated from these things, they were giving me other opportunities to speak. Like here, today, I got a call from Joyce, I got a call from Melvet, 
to be able to be a part of this panel today. I've been a part of other panels, and this work has led me to not only represent um, Hartford or do things statewide, I've also been had the opportunity to work on a national level. And it was as a result of the individuals that I've encountered who supported me, who have encouraged me, and um, who always recommend me to, con to, to do these jobs and to continue to improve. That's great. And you know, as Janine was speaking, I, I often think she talked about Maureen Bish, who was a wonderful director of the Asylum Hill Family Center. And her and I actually shared a common philosophy in that you, you see the potential, you nourish the potential, you provide safe opportunities to try out those leadership skills. So often the first step might be in the family center, for example, that a parent might get trained in a specific curriculum. And they, they go through the curriculum, they get trained in it, and then they become the co-facilitator of that curriculum. The other thing, a lot was done in that environment to have staff and parents be co-trained in different things, like Mind in the Making is an example that it, that it comes to mind. And then have parents take on a leadership role, and why I say that's in a safe environment is because it's a familiar environment. It's, a, it's an environment that they've already built relationships and have a support system. I mean, I'll give you, and then, and then you keep kind of elevating that a little bit as you work with the parents. So, I mean, we presented on national conferences with parents, local conferences with the parents. And, you know, I remember one of the parents that we were presenting at, on, at, at a conference right before she said, I think I'm gonna throw up. I'm like, and this is a person who had a lot of skills and we had done a lot of prep. Understanding the backbone support that's required for these things is key. And it will differ based on each parent that you work with. But putting in that time to do the prep and the support ahead of time is key. Because what you don't want is to put parents in situations that they are not prepared to be in. And I've seen that happen as well. And so, you know, just turning to her and saying, like, we got you. We all prepared together. I know your part. You know my part. So if I stumble, I want you to step in too. And if you stumble, I'm going to do that. We're all going to do the same thing. You know, and just, and then she, she, she did it beautifully. It was no problem. But did she had that moment of angst and really being able to recognize that and understand the type of support, what I call backbone support. And there's not a lot written about this, honestly, about how do you support that transition, as Janine said earlier, from me to we. Like, what's the process there to make that a legitimate process? And it's, driven by um, the goals of the parent to do more. You're not pushing anybody into this, but when you recognize it, see it, and support it, it can be really a wonderful thing. So um, I'm gonna go back to you, Janine. Um, when you assume leadership roles, how, how have schools or uh, programs or other institutions shown that they value your input? I'll start with two, Jen. Um, being at the table as a parent in two, Jen, as Joyce mentioned initially, we sat on the outskirts because we thought it was another, it, we thought it was just another um, situation where parents needed to be there, but they didn't really value what we, we had to share or valued our input. And being invited to the table, like physically invited to the table, by um, organization heads and um, state leaders and really listening to what we had to share and listening to the changes that we thought were necessary to ensure that they were really grasping that whole family approach was, I think that, I think that for me was mind changing and career changing for me because it, it made me realize that Connecticut find like they, they got it, like they understood that it in order to provide services 
for individuals in a community, you have to listen to the voices of the community. And they really embraced us and legislation, the, the language in the legislation was changed based on the input that we shared. And that was incredibly empowering for me to be able to say that me as a parent was able to go out to different institutions, um, PTO meetings, different community organizations, talk about what was happening, listening to the voices of the people in the community and bringing that back to that space and then having amendments made based on that input was incre incredibly empowering for me. And um, I take it back to the Family Center where we were not just parent ambassadors just because. Like We had input in every aspect of the Family Center from employees that were being hired. We had the opportunity to interview these employees but our, our interviewees, I'm sorry, but not only just interview them, but be prepared to ask like really core questions. And, and um, we gave inf um, input on grant writing and um, program development. And so, so this is, I cannot stress how much I cannot stress how much I value the leadership at these organizations, the leadership in Connecticut, and how they embrace parent leadership, and how they embrace parent engagement, and how they embrace the family, and having the family at the center of the design of the services that um, they're putting in place to improve family life and bringing family to sustainable living. I think you know Janine brought out some very important points. This this idea of listening, but not just listening, seeing their words incorporated into the design of what you're doing. I've had parents come together and they give all this input, and then there's no feedback to them about how any of that information was used to develop whatever plan. I do have to give a quick shout out. Um, to my colleague at the Harvard Foundation for Public Giving, Richard Sussman, because you know people say, how did these family centers, you've heard several of them talk about the Brighter Futures Family Center, which was a 20 year investment, in the over 20 year investment by the Harvard Foundation for Public Giving. And the thing is, people say, well, how did that happen? How did they become so parent and community driven? And I always say they were different from design, in design from the beginning. So written into those grants and those contracts. And think about this when you're writing grants and contracts. You know, they had to have an advisory council that was made up of stakeholders from the communities and parents that were actually uh, utilizing services at the center. And it had to be over 50% representation of those folks. Not one or two, but mostly. So I think you know when you're thinking about how you create a program design, be thinking about that inclusiveness to get this kind of feedback from parents that you really need to be successful. So Susan, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Um, how, what did it look like when schools or other institutions or, uh, or organizations valued your input? For me, um, the value of it was all the training that I got. Um, not just the training, because I also see many parents going through head class, PLTI, and then um, nothing happened. Um, they just, it just died there. But um, one of the things that I stressed out when I was in the family center was to, okay, so what's next now? I feel like I have learned, I, I learned so much from you guys. I, we need to move forward with this. And uh, they, they say, okay, what would you like uh, to do with the other families? So we started like a, um, a circle uh, of parents. Um, they invited me to be the um, part of the parent board. Um, and we had so much input on the family center. Then also, that took me to um, connect with Joyce Bosco and be uh, a consultant for the Heart Foundation. 
um, which it took me to a totally different thing, uh, meetings with um, meetings and then being part of Craftsy, this awesome group that Joyce uh, has. Um, it's a, a network for the city of Hartford, and I met so many wonderful people there, and it changed my whole perspective of how um, a lot of you guys are working towards, you know, for the families, for the well of the families. And I think when you, when we have the, the like a small group, I see myself like, you know, this is a small group, we don't see all the work that you guys do. And I always try to communicate that to, to the families that, that I'm involved with. You know, as you are trying so hard to strengthen your families and, you know, um, if we all want the best for our children, you know, there there is a big group of people, you know, you guys working for that, with that purpose. And I think that was one of the awesome things that I took from all, all these trainings and all these um, opportunities to see that. I, I couldn't see it before, but then when I was exposed to it, I was able to see it and also to communicate to, to the families. But also, one of the big things for me was whole, uh, me being whole responsible. Uh, for, um, if, um, so now this is what I'm doing. I'm doing the circle of parents. Now we're do, we, want, we would like to do this event. So now you guys have all the tools that you need. So um, the family center was, we are gonna support you. Joyce was like, okay, so now this is your baby. I'm gonna support you. And holding me responsible. And don't be afraid to hold your parents responsible. I have met many um, uh, uh, people that work with families that they feel like they are on their tiptoes <laughs> uh, with their families because, I don't know, maybe they don't want to lose them or maybe, you know. Uh, but no, I think parents are really capable um, of, you know, a, a stepping up and I think just to give them the right opportunity where they, they can uh, support you. You know, that was one of the big things for me. It was, I would go to the family center, I'll be like, Carmen, what do you need? How can I help you? And, you know, she would give me all these tasks a little by little, you know, I developed um, skills um, that now I have a, a new job, which I didn't see myself <laughs> um, being a program coordinator for families, and now I am. And so this is a result of the, the, the work that you do with your families. Thank you, Susan. And you know, Susan talked about you know, working with parents. You know, I saw Susan master, masterly do what she was just talking about because one of her roles when she worked with me um, was to um, host, help host community cafes around early development instrument results throughout the city of Hartford. And the idea was to bring these results out to the community and then get their feedback about ideas they had about how to work with some of the vulnerabilities. And if, for folks that don't know, that's a tool that measures school readiness. Um, and it, but the results went back to the neighborhoods that the children lived in. So it was really more about like what are the resources and supports within neighborhoods and communities that are helping parents get their children ready for school. So she would bring, and that was a little bit of a game changer in this work as well because the parents hosted those cafes with backbone support from the organizations they were in. So it developed leadership skills. So they were the ones in the forefront with those cafes. And I found even organizations that really were promoting leadership skills, um, they found this to be a bit of a game changer for them because they actually didn't know that well how to just sit back and guide a process as opposed to controlling a process. And so um, I saw people emerge as leaders um, that prior to that, the organization didn't really see them in that capacity. I remember I was at one community cafe, it was all being done in Spanish, which I, I know a little bit of Spanish, living in Hartford for 35 years, but I don't know a lot. and. Um, you know, the staff kept kind of hovering over the, the parent that was, that was hosting this cafe. And I had to say to the staff, she got this. Like, I could tell by the way the other parents in the room were reacting and her just whole demeanor that 
she was large, large and in charge. She didn't need this intervention that she was getting. So we, you know, it's, it's to support that growth and also let people fly when they're ready to fly. But I watched Susan where she would get a parent that might be very nervous about being involved in this capacity and she would give them just small little jobs to support what was doing. And then you'd see like after a few of the cafes had taken place, now this parent was assuming a leadership role in it. And so it's, it's like building that capacity a little bit at a time. And it's very, very effective. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, Joyce? Yes. I think people are wanting to ask questions. Yes, yeah, okay. Can we okay. do that? I bet you have a lot yeah. of questions out there. And, and we're right at that time, so that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. So, I was just going to go through, though, let the panelists one time say, I feel valued when, and I just answer it. that really, really quickly, okay? So we can start. Janine, you got a mic? Uh, Who's yeah. got a mic? <laughs> could, could, could you, would you? Sure, no problem. When you and this is, this is really a quick run through because people in the room do have yeah. questions, I'm sure, but. valued when I am asked to assist with the design of a new program or a policy. Well, I feel valued when I'm able to be a good representation for my son, no matter what uh, division or arena it is. So just being a leader just makes me feel good. I feel valued when I'm put in a position to help other people. I believe helping other people adds value to myself and adds value to the community. I feel valued when I'm here with all of you, so. I feel valued when I'm treated as a partner. I feel valued as being like 18, being 18 years old and doing something positive in the community. And I feel valued when my children's school team shares information with me and listens to the information that I share with them. And I feel valued when I get to represent other families of students with disabilities at tables like this. Yeah, can we just give a big round of applause?